Thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, this is Quality Design in a Fast-Paced Environment. My name is Jesse Larson, and today we're gonna be going through our real-time process for how we think about approaching real-time work. So when we make real-time content, we want there to be a high level of quality to the type of design that we're doing. We also want there to be a lot of flexibility with our content, and I'll get a little bit more into exactly what is meant by that. And then we also wanna strike a balance between something that looks good and something that's performant. And so what we're gonna be doing this, uh, today is we're going to be looking at our thought process, our philosophy for how we approach our content, and then go through uh, the entire design process from gray boxing all the way to bringing things inside of Unreal Engine and show how we are taking that thought process and applying it to each of those different stages. So let's start. So with our design process, uh, the first thing that we need to be thinking about is that this is not a linear process. And what that means is that all of these stages are connected. Um, that I can't wait until something is uh, uh, textured to start thinking about how my UVs are going to be affecting that. I can't wait until my UV stage to think about how my modeling is going to be affecting that. I need to be thinking in advance to set myself up uh, in, uh, down the line for success. And so what that really means is that how I build content really, really matters. A big part of that too is that in real-time broadcasts, there is no traditional compositing like we might have in Photoshop or After Effects or Nuke. And so this, this is another thing that plays into making sure that you build your content well. Another thing with that is in regular motion design, I have complete control over where I put my camera. And so I can make sure that when I'm designing something, maybe even if the model isn't fully fleshed out or the lighting looks great from one side but not from the other side, I can make sure that I'm only looking at it from the side that looks good. But in real time, I can't do that. I don't know where the directors are gonna be putting that camera. They might do one thing one week, and they might do something another week. And so I need to make sure that when I'm building this content out, that it's built out completely. And so that way, regardless of how they're gonna be looking at this thing, it still looks really good. Another thing that I need to be keeping in mind is that sometimes I need to light and have reflections inside of a vacuum. And what that means is when I'm building out an environment, I have all of the things from that environment uh, to cast, uh, uh, it could be balanced lighting, it could be reflections that are showing up inside of assets like logos or, or other things uh, that are in that environment. But sometimes I'm creating assets that are living on their own. I might have logos or, or other AR elements that are living inside of a practical set or I might throw them up inside of a, a football field. And those things still need to look good as well. And so sometimes I'm doing this kind of stuff inside of a vacuum. There's not an environment that is casting uh, reflections and lighting onto these assets. And so to help out with that, I need, to, I need to build a lot of flexibility into these assets. That could be things like texture masks, material selections, uh, how I do my UVs, am I doing one UV set, am I doing two UV sets? Uh, maybe there's some modularity with this as well. When we're starting off, when, when I started off uh, several years ago in the real-time process, there was a lot of back and forth. Uh, I would do my modeling, jump into UVs, oh, I should have done it this way, go back into the modeling, fix it, jump back into UVs, all right, now this is where, where I want it to be, go into texturing, find out there is an issue with my UVs and have to jump back, and there's a lot of back and forth that you do. But as you get a little bit more experience, you start to uh, pick up on these cues or on these things uh, from experience about how you should be building this content. And that, that really contributes to being able to get through the, this content a lot faster. And so as you're building that, that mental library of how this stuff should be built, a lot of that back and forth dies down. Um, but part of that too is also being very intentional with the way that you're building your content. The last thing for this is that I have to brace for change. I can't always predict how the content that I build is gonna be used. Uh, I could have a really good conversation with my producer throughout the whole process. Uh, I could have a really good idea for where they might be heading with this, but ultimately, things change. For instance, a couple weeks ago, uh, they took one of the environments that we had done and they did a uh, water overlay with fish swimming through it. It made it look like there was, uh, this environment was inside of an aquarium. And I can guarantee you when I was first concepting this, uh, this environment out and building it, it, it was not running through my head if they were ever gonna put it inside of an aquarium. But that is an example of how these things can be used in creative and innovative ways that furthers uh, the ability of our producers and directors to be able to tell good stories. So now this gets to our design process. And the very first part of that is gray boxing. So now, as we go through these stages, 
uh, each of these stages has a very particular intent. And so uh, with gray boxing, uh, we're, going to be building this we're going to be building complexity in stages, and this stage is all about showing form. I'm not trying to show the, the final thing with this. It's really just about figuring out what this space is going to be. And so to help out with that, I want to keep things rough. Uh, I don't want to get into fine level of de uh, detail modeling. Uh, I want to keep things pretty rough. Uh, I want to focus on the shape. I want to focus on the silhouette. In this example, you can see a before and after from when we're doing gray boxing to the final inside of Unreal. And for the one on the left, that's our hangar environment. And for that one, we really didn't have much of an idea for what we wanted this thing to be. And so keeping it loose was a really important part of this process so that as we were going through and making creative decisions, we could start building this up into what it eventually became. Now this other one on the right, this is our ins and outs environment. And when we were starting off with this, we had gotten a design package for NFL 23. And one of the style frames that was in there, we thought would make, we could riff on it a little bit and it would make a cool environment. And so we had a little bit more of an idea for what this one would be. But we still wanted to get in there, do a gray box of it, really kind of make sure that we were getting everything set. Uh, that way we could build this thing up in stages and make this the best that it possibly could be. Now as we're building uh, these, uh, like I said first, we want to focus on shape and silhouette, but we also want to focus on a sense of scale. Uh, one of the things that we get, get asked a lot, uh, this isn't just for environments, it can also be for AR elements, is they want us to take these elements and they want them to be super big. We want to, especially when you're out in a football field, make this thing massive, make this thing huge. But typically what we end up doing is we take a logo and we just scale it up. And it's like, well, that doesn't actually feel big, though. And so how can we design these things in a way where these, these elements actually communicate scale? So one of the ways that we do that is by driving scale with contra contrasting shape sizes. So this cube, for instance, how big is it? No idea. But if we start putting other shapes around it, now we start having a contrasting uh, collection of, of objects where this shape in the middle, this is now communicating a sense of scale. And so to put that into practice a little bit, when we were designing for USFL, now you can't really take a logo and change the silhouette of it, but you can play around a little bit with the depth. And so that's one of the things that we were doing with these logos to try to communicate that sense of scale. This isn't always something that you can do. Um, it's definitely something that I like to push us for, uh, to strive for, but this does take a level of intent. And so when possible, uh, going routes like this I think is a really good idea. Another way that we can drive scale is with relatable elements. So in this environment, going back to our hangar environment that we saw before, those staircases on the side, those weren't just a cool design feature, but they were something that we were very intentional uh, about putting in there to help communicate scale. Now as we're walking around, even just walking around and sitting in this room right here, there's a lot of things that start uh, communicating scale inside of my minds, even if we're not consciously thinking about it. It could be the stairs that lead up to the stage, it could be the chairs that are here, it could even be the lights that we have around. And so as we're going about life, we're building up this, this, this visual library of things, and to add some of the, that kind of content into the sets and the designs that we're building, it really helps start to communicate scale because people can relate to those things because they see them every day. This was another uh, environment that we did. Or it wasn't really an environment, so it was more of like an AR, AR element. Um, this was something that we did for USFL is in the end zone. The end zone opens up and this thing comes out. But this is where we're using uh, a scale, a contrasting scale from those panels. You have Fox, you have USFL in these panels. You have the little lights top and bottom, contrasting in shape size. Uh, also for the player uh, images, the panels that they're on, those little lights at the top. Uh, those are reminiscent of uh, aircraft safety lights that you would see on top of water towers or cell phone towers or things like that. Something that you're typically only going to see on taller structures, but again, it also is communicating a contrast and shape. And so you get that sense of scale because of those elements that are put in there. Now, once we've gone through the gray boxing uh, f phase a little bit and we, we've started to flesh out what something might look like, we're going to want to take that environment and put it inside of VR. And for that, we're using Twin Motion and a Vive Focus 3 headset. And VR really helps resolve a mis misperception of space. Uh, a couple years ago, we were designing an environment and we had built it all out instead of Unreal. We thought it looked great. We got all the, went through the entire approval process. And then we got it to our group in the back 
that was going to be setting it up on our green screen, and we very quickly heard back from the director, is like, yeah, we can't use this. And I was like, what? Like, we had put all this time into it, and yet this was still something they couldn't use. And the reason for that was because when we were designing, we were only looking at what we could see inside of the monitor. And we weren't really getting, even though we were moving the camera around in Unreal, we still weren't getting a really good perception of how this space related to itself. But once they were able to get the camera uh, in the back where our green screen studio was, they, they got a much better idea about it and they realized that this was a very constrained environment. There's really only one way that you could look. And so it didn't give them a lot of options for how they could shoot this thing. And so uh, we wanted to have a solution where we could start uh, figuring that stuff out earlier on in the process, not waiting until the very end and then realizing that the only way to fix this was to almost start over. Now, kind of as, as an aside, uh, Twinmotion is uh, a great tool to be able to get in there and figure out that misperception of space. But the other thing, too, is that there's a cool factor to it. When, when you're designing something, when you're building something out, it's one thing to see it on uh, a screen or to see it on TV, but to actually be able to physically walk around, well, virtually walk around, in the environment that you designed is a pretty cool experience. One of the other things that we can do with VR is it gives us an opportunity to start thinking about camera um, and how we could use a camera. And so one of the things that we'll do, uh, ju just curious, how many of you guys have actually used uh, Twinmotion? Couple, okay. So when you're inside of Twinmotion, you, you have uh, the two little joysticks, the two little hand controls, and it's almost like fishing. There's like a line, uh, and at the end of that line, there is like a little arrow uh, that kind of designates the direction that you're gonna be looking. Uh, you're kind of almost like casting where you wanna cast yourself uh, in that location. Now we have a space in our studio where it gives us a little bit of room where we can walk around in it, so you, get, you can get a little bit of that, uh, that parallax effect. Um, but the, the, that little fishing line type thing is how we actually get around most, most of the set. And so one of the things that we'll do is we'll end up setting up these little platforms that we can kind of like hop up on top, top of and get a little bit of a better vantage point of uh, how a camera could be used more effectively in, the, in this scene. And also start realizing how, how this scene or who th this scene is gonna be going to, which director it's going to be going to, how do they typically like to shoot their, their scenes and making sure that we're designing something that is tailored to them. So once we've gone through all of that, we're gonna, be, we're gonna develop this a little bit further. And what I wanna show you next is that process of going from gray box all the way through the final geo. And so we're going through, we're trying to figure out what the space is gonna be. We're gonna drop the floor a little bit more, push things out a little bit more. Uh, and just start figuring out, fleshing out what the details for this could be. And then at the very end, we, we realized that this was kind of become a, becoming a corridor cave-like type thing, and so we added like these atrium style lights at the very top um, to let a lot more light in. Once we figured out what uh, this basic shape for the gray boxing is gonna be, we're gonna wanna move on to GPU renders, because showing that kind of stuff like we just saw before, that's great for internal and for our team uh, of designers to look at, but we need to be showing uh, our higher ups, the producers, the directors, what this thing is actually gonna be looking like. And so that's where the GPU side of things comes in. We start adding lighting, uh, some basic materials, um, but we're not trying to show a final. This is all about showing directional intent. Uh, good geo, good UVs, things like that, all of that takes time. And if we're putting all of that time into something that's not been approved yet, that can waste a lot of time. And so we wanna be smart with how we're approaching this stuff and we wanna work quickly. So that could be things like keeping lights and materials simple uh, and that way that gives us more times for iteration. Could also be things like using UV projection methods so that saves us time from actually having to make UVs. This is an example of uh, before and after from uh, this past Super Bowl. Uh, on the top we have our octane renders and on the bottom is the final inside of Unreal. And so you can see here that there, there is quite a bit of similarity between befores and afters. But one of the things that you can notice is that especially things like effects, that's not really something we fleshed out until we got inside of Unreal. Uh, we wanted to hint at it a little bit, but we're not gonna show the final, we're not really gonna figure out what the final is going to be in, until we're inside of, inside of Unreal. That also gives us an opportunity to really figure out how we're gonna be lighting this, how we're gonna be doing our textures, uh, et cetera. 
We also want to look for opportunities for, for our assets to be modular. This saves us a lot of time in building things out where we're not modeling the same thing over and over and over again. So again, uh, the top is Octane, the bottom, bottom is the final in, in, in Unreal. And these are both good examples of how we're using modularity throughout our process of building. And so on the left, in our hangar environment, uh, a lot of those columns, pretty much everything on one side is duplicated on the other side. So we didn't build both sides out because they're essentially the same thing. Uh, in our ins and outs environment, those angular wall pieces that go front to back and side to side, those are all the same thing. They just, one is rotated one way and the, the back two are rotated a, a different way, but it's, a, it's the same thing. And that gave us a lot of flexibility um, inside of Unreal to change uh, the way things are colored or the type of material that was, was on it. It just gave us a lot more flexibility once we were inside of Unreal. And this one here actually meant to have a Octane one at the top, but um, this one still shows uh, that, that mentality of trying to be efficient with how we're putting these things together. And so sometimes when we get asks from production, they, they want everything. And so for this one, we kind of had that a little bit where they wanted to be able to have logos where they could switch uh, on and off. They wanted to be able to have um, stats, uh, scores, headlines, uh, a possibility to do replays. Uh, video replays, and so trying to think through how can we cram all of that stuff into a, uh, a smaller space takes a little bit to think through, and especially when you're approaching it from gray box stage where things are super rough, it gives you a lot of opportunity to really start thinking through how you can put these things together. And so we have our logo side, we can turn that panel completely on and off, we can switch logos out, uh, where we have the stats, we can take all of that away and we can put logo plates in with uh, scores if we wanted to. And then this last uh, section over here with the headers, uh, this is a 16 by nine form format. We have a transitional effect that we, that, uh, we could apply uh, that would turn this into something where we could show replays. So we've gone through that process. We've done our gray boxing. We have got our GPU renders. We've got them to approval. We've got approval. Now we're ready to build things. Now, at the very beginning of uh, th this talk, we were, we were talking about things uh, being linear um, or not being linear, uh, that that's not the way that we want to approach things. But up until this point, and even after, if we're not doing something about it, the way that we're building this content is linear. And that can be really, really inefficient if we take that all the way to the end, because now we're gonna be putting time into modeling, and then we have, to, we have to do modeling before you can get into UVs, you have to do UVs before you get into texturing, and so forth. And if you wait until you get all of these assets inside of Unreal, before you start doing anything like functionality, you can really, you can, you can really constrain the amount of time that people have to do that functionality. And that is a, that's a really important part of the process. And so we needed to figure out a way where we could start working in tandem with them. And so one of the ways that we do that is once we're ready to start doing our modeling, what we'll do is we'll take those assets and we'll figure out what our access point is going to be. Uh, and then we'll provide uh, the tech team with a temporary uh, mesh that they can use either as reference or they could use as a placeholder to start putting in their functionality as we're then taking those same assets and refining them and making them the final. And then once we, we get inside of Unreal, because the access points are the same, we can just swap them out for the final, the final asset. But now we're, we're in modeling, we're ready to go. We really need to start being aware of how our modeling impacts our UVs and our lighting. In this example, when I was starting off modeling uh, many years ago, one of the ways that I probably would have done uh, that outer edge, that orange edge, edge, is it would just be one piece. But the problem with that, especially when it comes to UVs, is that now I have this, what is like a, almost like an angular upside down U, uh, that that could really start to take over my UV space in a way that really crunches down all of my UV islands and forces them to be smaller, especially if I'm trying to have consistency across my UV islands with how big everything is. And so one of the things that you can do to kind of help mitigate that, again, by thinking ahead, is you can start introducing things like seams to break up these, these pieces a little bit more efficiently. And so by breaking them up, adding those scenes, it gives me an opportunity to start cutting things inside of our UV software uh, a little bit better. And now I can have them uh, in a more organized way that gives me a little bit more flexibility in my UV space for how all of this stuff is laid out. This is the floor from our ins and outs scene. So on our left, that's initially what we were, we were doing. Um, and 
for uh, when we were starting off, we were just going to be having one, one person, Jay Glazer, was going to be in there, um, and this was where he was going to be doing the ins and outs section, uh, segment of the Fox NFL show. But as we were moving along, we realized that we could transition that to having this be more of our generic set where we were going to have the entire uh, talent cast, which is up to five guys or possibly even more, depending on what we're doing. And we needed a little bit more space for uh, those guys to be standing on. And so we expanded the footprint of that area. Well, once we did that, that, is, that ended up being a large area that was pretty blank. And so that's pretty boring. Uh, and so we wanted to find a way where we could make this space a little bit more interesting. We didn't want to call it out too much, um, but still give it a little bit more interest and let the light kind of play over it a little bit more. And so just thinking about how light was going to be interacting with this uh, and knowing that our, our talent, because of this is something that we had inside of our LED volume, uh, which is more of a rectangular shape, that typically talent doesn't go to the sides. And so that was a little bit more of an opportunity to kind of play around with what this thing looked like. Now, this is a little bit out of order, but that's kind of intentional um, because the way that we, uh, I, I don't want to constantly be going back and forth. I'm, I'm modeling, and now I'm UVing, and now I'm modeling again uh, in this present presentation. But that's a little bit how our, how our workflow goes, where we'll model, and then we will, uh, once all the modeling is done, we will take that instead of uh, piece by piece inside of our UV software. We'll UV that piece, and then we'll start figuring out how I want to group things together. And actually, I'll get to that part in a little bit. Um, and then I'll go back into my UV section, and I will uh, pack everything the way that I want it to be. And then I'll go back into modeling, and I'll figure out things like uh, how I'm going to be do doing my smoothing, uh, how, and then also doing material selections. And so this is a really important part of the process uh, that I have found makes a pretty big impact on the quality of work that you can do. And so in this example, this is something that we did for Super Bowl this past year. Uh, it, it's a smaller object, but by adding material selections, so on the, uh, on the left here you can see uh, the look inside of Cinema. Um, Cinema 4D is a, a 3D software that we use. Um, we made quite a number of material selections on there, but what that allowed us to do is, once we were inside of Unreal, we were really able to tune and to finesse this thing to, to really pull out that, that good quality final look before it went on air. And by having these material selections, yes, it does add a little bit more of an overhead, but because it's a small, smaller piece, that doesn't have as big of an impact. Now, if I was doing this on uh, a full-on environment, that would be a lot more impactful, probably not a good idea. But for smaller elements, doing stuff like this, you can push these, these things a little bit further with the quality that you're getting. And so the way that we approach, and I think this is a good example of it, the way that we approach our content is not a one size fits all, but it's more of a tool bag approach where sometimes for some things, going a little bit further, doing some things that maybe aren't the most efficient, but you can get a better quality look is the best route to go. Now we're kind of through, through the, uh, a little out of order, but we're, we're through the modeling stage. We're getting into UVs. And for these, we want these to be as few cuts as possible. Uh, we, we really want to maximize uh, uh, the, the space that we can have in here. Um, this, this also kind of goes back to uh, when we're doing light baking inside of Unreal 4. Really looking forward to that coming back. Um, but doing few cuts as possible. We don't want to have a lot of tiny little pieces. Sometimes that's unavoidable, but the, the more that you can have your UVs in uh, bigger chunks, the better the textures kind of flow across them. We also want to set textile density for consistent texture resolution uh, across multiple assets. So when you're having an environment, when you're having a collection of assets like what we did for Super Bowl, uh, there are a, a number of things that you're producing. And you want to have a consistent look across all of them. You don't want to have two assets on screen and one, the textures look soft, another one, the textures look really crisp. You want there to be uniformity uh, for that. And the way that you do that is by making sure that your UV islands have a consistency across all of them. We also want to group our meshes in a way so that we don't have an abundance of texture sets. Uh, the way that we do our texturing, um, we have a base color, we have a, a, an RMA, a packed, uh, channel packed RMA, and we have a normal map. And every extra texture set that we have, 
that is a multiplication of three for three more textures. And so the, the more thoughtfully we can group our meshes together, and I'll show you an example of this in a moment, um, the, that really reduces the amount of textures that we're gonna be, we're gonna be creating. We also wanna think about how our UV islands are oriented. Uh, so if we were trying to do something, if you think back to uh, that earlier example with that uh, orange, orange strip and how we were introducing seams to cut that apart, uh, if I wanted to have something like anisotropic noise uh, along that, I'd wanna make sure that all of those UV islands were oriented in the same way. Um, and by looking through all of your assets and making sure that there is uniformity to them, uh, that gives you a lot of flexibility when you come into texturing to make sure that you can do the best textures that are possible. So here's a couple examples from our, our hangers, hanger environment. And the, this is what I mean by grouping things thoughtfully. So it's not just about, yes, each of these things are made up of individual pieces, but I don't wanna have those individual pieces on their own. Um, again, this kind of goes back to uh, efficiency, uh, and maybe this isn't the most efficient way to do it, but at the same time, if, if I had all of these things broken apart into individual meshes, I could easily start winding up having hundreds and hundreds of meshes that now I have to corral, I have to maintain, I have to keep track of where they are, and while it might be more efficient, it's, it's, it, it makes it uh, a lot more difficult to, to work effectively with that. And so by grouping these things together, um, I can be a little bit more intentional with how I have these things when I'm bringing them inside of Unreal. Uh, I also wanna be careful with how I'm packing these things. And so you can see with, uh, uh, with these examples down here, um, I wanna be really thoughtful with how I'm laying things, these things out. Now, uh, with the, uh, the UV software that we're using, there are things where it can auto pack, pack all of these UV islands for you. But one of the things that I found is that it doesn't always do a really good job with making sure that these are oriented and placed in the most appropriate ways. Um, and sometimes, especially if you're going for consistency across all of your UV islands, it doesn't do a really good, it doesn't do a good job uh, helping you along with that either. And so a lot of this stuff sometimes, the way that I do it, is it's a, it's a very manual process. Now for lights, uh, this is one of those things where when I'm, th when I'm thinking through how I am laying out my UVs, when I'm trying to group my uh, meshes together, I'm gonna have lights sometimes that are in different parts and pieces. But if I'm intentional with where on the UV space I'm placing those light UVs, I can then bring all of the UVs together inside of one Substance Painter project and texture everything um, all at once. I, that also means that I, can only, that I will only have one, one texture, or at least in this instance, only one texture for all of those lights across an entire environment. And that just makes it a lot more efficient than um, having these lights and the UVs be kind of wherever, and you end up with having a lot more textures that you, you have to have, a lot more unique textures. Now once I'm through the modeling, once I'm through the texturing, uh, once I'm through the UVs, uh, I'm now ready to bring all of these assets inside of Unreal. And for environments specifically, because we are being intentional with how we are placing uh, the access point, because before we export out, uh, we're gonna be zeroing out all of those assets uh, to make it easier to work with inside of Unreal, I need a way to reconstruct this thing that I'm building. And so what I'll do is I'll take, create a temporary FBX, uh, a temporary mesh of the environment, and then use that as reference so that I can then place these, uh, the meshes uh, more effectively and recreate this environment. I also wanna use this as an opportunity to start setting up uh, some basic lighting and materials. This is a really good opportunity to start thinking about what I need to do uh, uh, in any kind of texturing that I'm gonna be doing. Um, when you're doing things inside of GPU rendering, it's not always gonna look exactly the same as uh, what you see inside of Unreal, and actually I would not expect it to. And so what that means sometimes is that uh, I'll do one thing inside of uh, Octane, which is what we use for GPU rendering, but it's not gonna translate exactly to Unreal. And so by setting up that temporary lighting, the temporary textures, or the temporary materials, it gives me an opportunity to start thinking through um, how, how this thing is going to be, uh, how this thing is gonna show up, and potentially looking out for any errors or any issues that might arise. 
And this was an example of one of those things that came up. I had two meshes, as you can kind of see in the bottom left over here, uh, the one L shape in the back and another panel that was in the front. But because both of them had unlit materials on, on them because they were screens, they started to blend into each other. And so by recognizing that at this stage, I was able to create a gradient that for the back, that back panel that went from black to white, uh, from side to, uh, one side to the other. Uh, and that gave me an opportunity inside of the material to start making sure that that back one, uh, both of these panels, they started to have a little bit of offset from each other. For textures, once we have some of that stuff figured out, for, for textures, a lot of this is about providing flexibility. When I'm building textures, most of my time is spent in base color and roughness, maybe in the height channel. I'm looking at those and making sure that I have enough, enough variety, enough flexibility, so that way when I get inside of Unreal, I can push and pull those things a little bit to really get that final look. Um, Painter is not the final destination for all of this. We're not broadcasting out of Painter, and so while it might look good in Painter, that's not my intent. I want it to look good in Unreal. And so my, my purpose inside of Painter is to set myself up for success inside of Unreal. I'm also going to be exporting everything out of Painter uh, or Designer, depending on which one I'm using, in 4K. Uh, Unreal is a pretty powerful piece of software. And uh, initially, when we were thinking through texturing, we would have a 4K version, a 2K version, a 1K version. And that just becomes very unwieldy. And one of the things that we were able to figure out um, is that inside of the, the texture panel, there's an option where you can actually reduce the texture. And so if you bring your, your texture in at 4K, realize you need it to be 2K, you can set your texture to be 2K, and it's the same thing as if you brought in a 2K image. And so that just gives us a lot of flexibility inside of the engine to reduce things as needed. We're also gonna be channel packing masks, so things like RMA, light bakes, effects, and that just gives us a better opportunity to be more efficient with the amount of textures that we're gonna be bringing in. In this example, we have the American flag from the national anthem spot that we did from this past Super Bowl. Uh, the, the stars and stripes, uh, all of that, that flag was done inside of designer, gave a really good opportunity to uh, go into the details with uh, uh, the embossing on the stars and some of the stitching for the stripes. Um, but then it was taken inside of Painter, and it, we were able to do a final pass on it to really play around with giving some variation for the base color, for the roughness, uh, for how, how intense some of the normals were. Um, but then down in this, this corner over here, uh, in the uh, bottom right corner, uh, I also wanted to make sure that we had some flexibility for the coloring inside of Unreal. Now, there's different ways that you can go about doing this. And sometimes just putting in the hex code when you're inside of Unreal, that's, that's enough. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not necessarily about having something that is uh, accurate on that side. It's more of like, does it look right? And ultimately, that's really what matters. And so by having these masks in here, it gave me the ability as needed to be able to push and pull the, the colors on the American flag just to make sure that they were showing up uh, as the right colors. Now once we jump into, into material, this is all about being able to have flexibility for that last level of polish, uh, that last level of finesse. And with this, it's, it's really just about this constant effort to balance out performance and flexibility. Uh, this is a, a little bit of an example for how we have some of our, mater our materials laid out. Um, we are trying to do things like contrast, hue, shoot, hue shift, saturation. The one that I actually use probably the most is the brightness override. Now this is not some kind of uh, huge shift that we're doing. Um, this is about tiny little incremental changes just to uh, add that final level of polish. Uh, also for the RMA, for the roughness, we're gonna be pi piping that into the alpha of a lerp. Uh, we're gonna have a scaler for the override min, a scaler for the override max, and that way we're able to grab both ends of that and just kind of play and push around it just a little bit more, gives us a little bit more flexibility for that final, that final look that we're going for. For lighting, again, this is kind of the theme of this talk. It's all about performance. It's all about balance, balancing performance and what looks good. Uh, one of the opportunities that we, we have with this is sometimes when we're putting lights in, uh, we don't always need to have cast shadows on. Um, it, it, 
it's surprising as you get into there uh, and you have like all of these little lights. I mean, even just looking around this room, uh, there are multiple light sources that we have in here that make this room feel like it's alive. And by replicating that inside of Unreal, sometimes those lights, like these lights right above, casting down, how effective are, if, if this was something that we were building, building inside of Unreal, how effective are cast shadows from lights like that? And sometimes, in certain situations, not very much. And by turning that off, we end up getting a lot more performance back. Uh, we could also look at reducing attenuation radius and lights, and that can help out as well. So this is uh, going back to the hangar and uh, the hangar environment. Initially, we built that in Unreal 4, and we were able to use baked lighting for that. And that was amazing, that was great, because we were able to almost do whatever we wanted to light-wise, and then you bake it down, and you don't have to worry about things like light, light complexity, uh, because all of that is baked down into uh, the way that light baking worked in Unreal 4. But in Lumen, we had to think, start thinking a little bit more about how could we creatively go about replicating that look, but without throwing a bunch of extra lights in there. Because initially, when we did that, uh, this thing was almost uh, uh, at the very end of the spectrum here, and we were getting a lot of lighting complexity issues, uh, and so we needed to reduce this quite a bit. And so by thinking about things like turning off shadows, reducing attenuation radius, and then also thinking about uh, doing light baking, not in Unreal, but in Octane, and bringing those over as emissive masks, like you can see down here at the bottom, we were able to start regaining a little bit of that look, a little bit of that quality, without putting in a, a bunch of extra lights. So like I was saying before, selectively using octane light bakes, uh, another thing that we also use is, is fake HDRI. Now with the octane light bakes, uh, it, it is a, a temporary thing using that in environments, but for smaller elements, sometimes that can be really effective. Uh, with the advent of Lumen, that uh, definitely negates that a little bit, but back, uh, back la end of last year when we were doing World Cup, uh, we didn't have that option. And so we needed a way where we could create assets that looked really, really good inside of the engine, but they could still be dynamic. Um, and so at the top, that's kind of what we had before, before we did any kind of light baking, and that's definitely not what we wanted. Um, but by using light baking, by thinking about how we were modeling, how we were texturing, uh, we could get that final look that's at the bottom left and get, get a really nice look to the assets that we were building. Uh, Going back again to what we were talking about at the beginning about sometimes needing to have things inside of a vacuum. Um, when we were inside of Unreal 5, like we were for uh, when we were building out Gold Cup here, um, Lumen is really good. The lighting on this is what we wanted it to be, but the reflections weren't really there. Uh, there are a little bit of reflections, but there's not really much. And so what we're doing with fake HDRI is we are taking a reflection vector, we are putting that into the UV channel of a cube map, and then we're putting that inside of the emissive channel of a material. And by doing that, we, we can start to pull, pull in a much, much better look for things like metal, things like gold, uh, et cetera, uh, to really give it that pop that we're looking for. The last thing that I want to go over, go over in this talk is as we're building content, especially for teams that are building content, we need to be very aware with how we're building and how we're structuring our projects. Uh, the way that we put these things together really matters. Um, we have to understand that it's not just me building this, but there's a team of people that are coming in and are gonna be using this as well. And so the way that we structure our projects using folders, naming things, is a really important part of the process to help out anybody else who comes after me. So we've gone through the gray boxing stage, we've gone to the GPUs, we've gotten the final inside of Unreal, but talking about all of this stuff would not be enough with, without also talking about the team that we have that has worked on these things day in and day out for many years now. And just looking back on that process and being able to join it myself and just seeing how far we've come has been really inspirational and it makes me really thankful to be a part of that team. Two things that really help out with that though is really being intentional with how we're doing our communication, making sure that we're having calls on a regular basis. We have people on our west coast, we have people on the east coast, and so making sure that those two teams can communicate with each other well is a really important part of that process. Uh, we also have worked hard at making sure that we are establishing an environment where learning and growing is a big part of that process. Um, it, it, it's really easy to get stuck in your ways and, and how you think about design, um, but things change. Like we just went from four to five, and so learning that whole new Lumen process and Nanite 
uh, it's, it's really exciting. The things that we're gonna be doing, it's so much better than what we were doing before, but it's, it's a constant level of learning and growing. And by being in an environment that really encourages that sort of thing, uh, that's, that's been a really great place to be at. Because it's with those two things, it's learning and growing, really good communication, and you pair that with being very intentional with how you build your content, we can make sure that as going into the future, future we can continue to build really good content. Thank you so much for coming today.